And so in every celebration, if you think about any celebration you have, whether it's a birthday party for your children or whether it's a Christmas party that you go to or that you're hosting at your house, there is a time for preparation, isn't there? Whether it's a uh, concert that you're doing, whether it's a job that you're performing, whatever you do, there's always a preparation for what you are about to do, whether it's a party or a job or any function in order to, for that function to function properly, we have to be prepared. In the same way, the question this morning I wanted to pose to each and every one of us this morning is how does God prepare us? How does God prepare his people for the coming of Jesus Christ of this season in Advent? And unfortunately, I'm going to tell you the answer is a, a, a word that you and I do not like to hear. The word is discipline. Uh, discipline, nobody likes to be disciplined. No one. And I don't mean like discipline here as in like, you know, like your mom whipping you, you know, on your behind. I'm talking about the discipline that God gives to each and every one of us. And it's difficult. And this is a tough subject because many times Christians and pastors alike don't want to talk about God's discipline because it's hard. But we must talk about it because it does, it does have its meaning in Advent. And Isaiah actually talks about it in Isaiah chapter 40. In Isaiah chapter 40, the Israelites are crying out to God because they're, they're having a really hard time. They're having a hard time with the invaders that are coming in and invading their land. They are having a hard time not hearing God's voice. They feel like God has left them and forsook them. And I don't know if you've ever been in a place where we call the wilderness. Now, when I talk about the wilderness in, in, when I talk about the wilderness in a biblical context, it means sort of a dark night of the soul. And every one of us in this room might have gone through a really dark night period of time in our lives. That dark period may be even now. You may be going through a dark period even now. And many times we want to make sense of these dark periods in our life, don't we? We say things like, God, where are you? Why aren't you hearing me? Why isn't my prayers being answered? And we seek God in times like this when we are in the wilderness. Well, the Israelites were going through this period of darkness. And they're asking the Lord, God, where are you? What can you do? And so in the beginning of the chapter, you see that God starts off by saying, comfort. I want to comfort you. I'm there for you. I am here for you, Israelites. And so he's trying to comfort them, and he says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. And then this is where the next chapter, the famous verse, verse 3, comes in, in chapter 40. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. See, in this time when the Israelites are calling out to God and saying, where are you, Lord? He answers by saying this a voice of one calling. He's calling out. But to where? In our homes? In the city? No, he calls out to us where? In the wilderness. In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. 
This morning, I'm going to do a quick, just a, the Hebrew word study. I, I know nobody here, well, I don't, I don't know if you know how to read Hebrew, but this word for uh, desert is midbar. Midbar, okay? Uh, the, the lettering is M-D-B-R. Okay, and that's why we get the word midbar. But it's interesting that the Hebrew word for desert, midbar, it has the same consonants as the word in Hebrew for speaking. Speaking. And speaking in Hebrew is just a flip of the consonants. And instead of midbar, the Hebrew word to speak is medobar. Do you see the difference? Midbar and medobar. And I find this to be, it's no wonder that in these times of being in the desert, I believe what God is saying is, I can speak to you in the times of the desert more effectively than when we are not in the desert. Think about that for a moment. This is God's way of saying that it is in that desert place. It is in that difficult place that you and I may sometimes find ourselves in. That's the place where we have all of our attention pointed to God. And he says it, that it is in the wilderness that I want you to prepare the way for the Lord. And it is in that wilderness that God speaks to us the loudest. And so today's sermon is going to be very, uh, I hope very quick, but what I'm going to be talking about is three ways, three ways that the voice in the wilderness prepares our hearts. And the way that it does it is three ways. Number one is character development. Number two, that in this wilderness, we grow spiritually and we grow in maturity. And then finally, number three, it is in this wilderness period that we grow in empathy and compassion for one another. Uh, I want to first talk about the character development, and I'm going to talk about these three developments in our lives that God uses in the wilderness through three people in the Bible. The character development portion, this is where the challenges of the wilderness can refine and shape our character. I thought the best example, sorry, I thought the best example of God shaping someone's character in the wilderness is actually Joseph. If you know Joseph's story, if any of you have gone to church for, you know, a, a long time when you were young, uh, you know the story of Joseph. He starts out by this dream that God gives him. And God gives him this amazing dream where all of his brothers, all of his family, even his father, is going to one day bow down before him. Now he's young, he's 17. He's a young teenager. And his biggest mistake was actually going to his brothers and actually telling them that I am one day going to be better than you. Now, nobody in this room likes a young whippersnapper, a young kid telling them that one day you're going to bow to me. Nobody likes that. And so his brothers actually sell him into slavery. And not only does he get sold into slavery, but the next, the next years, the greatest years of his life is spent in jail cells because he was uh, unfairly prisoned for a crime that he did not commit. And even in the prison, he is dependent upon other people to set him free. And so he says to the baker and the cupbearer, he says, listen, when you get out of this jail, I really need your help. I really, really need your help. But when they get released, they forget all about him. They forgot all about Joseph. And so once again, Joseph is 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 forced 
Joseph is forced to take a look in his own heart and to see what is it that he's really trusting in. What is it that he's truly, his character is being developed. And for you and I, when you and I are going through a very painful wilderness experience, whether it's a loss of a job, or whether it's a loss of a a loved one, or whether it's going through marital problems, whatever, or relationship issues, when we are going through the wilderness, many times God uses this opportunity to, to encourage, not only encourage, but to develop the, our character. Because there are things that need working on. And so this is amazing. Through all the years of Joseph's pain, And through all the years of him going through this wilderness experience, this is the last words of Joseph to his brothers who betrayed him. On the very day that he can exact revenge and say, I am going to kill you all for what you've done to me, he doesn't say that. The kid who says, you know what, y'all are going to bow down to me one day. This kid, now as an adult, look at what he says. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, he says, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, which is the saving of many lives. Look at the stark difference between this teenager who is telling his brothers that one day you're going to bow down to me, to this adult who says, you know what, all of this was done. This is not your fault. It was all done by God. He was the orchestrator of all of this. He was the one who did this. And now I give all the glory to him. Do you see that character development from a teenager to now this fully functional adult? It's amazing. And I want to encourage each and every one of us, if you feel like you're in a period of wilderness where you're wondering, why is God doing this to me? Why has he forsaken me? Sometimes he's going to use these moments of wilderness experiences, these dark nights of the soul, to excavate what's really going on in our hearts. And maybe he wants to show us that maybe in our immaturity, that we, you know, might be too greedy or we might be loving ourselves too much or we might have issues that are unresolved. But it is through these wilderness experiences that God uses to excavate our souls. The second person I thought was, uh, and uh, again, Any great person in the Bible, if you look at their character, they've all gone through these wilderness experiences. Every single one of them. David, King David has gone through a wilderness experience. Abraham, the great father of our faith, has gone through wilderness experiences. Nobody is exempt from the wilderness of God. Moses, his wilderness was actually a... a, a development from God for his spiritual growth and maturity. Why do I say this? Does everybody remember how Moses came to be? Yes, he was a child that was saved in the Nile, but he grew up in the Pharaoh's house. He was well-educated. He was rich. He had everything he needed, but he ran into a problem. One of the Egyptians, one of the Egyptian masters was beating a Hebrew slave. Now, he knew himself he was a Hebrew. And so he took offense. And he was like, oh, man, that guy, that Egyptian is beating unfairly a a fellow Hebrew slave. So he kills this Egyptian. He kills the Egyptian. And he runs away. We can see through Moses' early life that he did, 
for some reason or another. Now, I believe it's because he was a Hebrew and he was raised in an Egyptian home. I think about all of the adoptive children that I know in my life who's had it, you know, who's had this identity crisis growing up. And I'm telling you, I, I feel for Moses because I think he was a child who felt that all throughout his life, he was just, he didn't belong anywhere. And so there was this anger that Moses had to deal with. And it doesn't just come where he kills this Egyptian and then he runs away and he's now in the wilderness for 40 years. God puts him in the wilderness. Uh, this, this man who was raised, you know, uh, with, a, with a high pedigree, he was in, he had the best education he could possibly get. He was in the palace where everything he wanted was at his disposal yet he had an anger issue. And so God sends him to this desert place where he tends sheep for 40 years, going from high to a low position. And in that low place of his life, in that wilderness, this is where God calls him through the bush, the burning bush. And he says, Moses, I want you to free the people. And it is at Moses' lowest point that God calls him. And many times for you and I, sometimes it's going to be our lowest point of life where God calls us because that's the only point in life that we'll ever hear him. Sometimes we are so distracted by the things of this world, that it has to take something to get to that low place for us to finally hear God. And it's interesting that, that, so for the first 40 years, God is shaping his life and trying to tame his anger. But then in the next 40 years of his life, where God is literally taking him through the wilderness with the, Egypt, uh, with the Israelites, it's so funny that he yet shows his anger problem once again. And it's in, the, it's in the Bible verse, it's in the verse where God tells Moses, I want you to touch the rock and water will start flowing out. But Moses gets so angry that instead of obeying God and touching the rock with his staff, he actually hits it because all the people are complaining to him and he's taking everyone's anxiety onto himself and he's like, God, did you send me out here to die? And then he just strikes the rock and then that's when God says, you know what? You haven't learned your lesson and it is because you disobeyed my voice that you will not be able to get into this promised land. And so 80 years of Moses' life he is spent dealing with his anger issues. And what God is doing in that wilderness period is trying to bring to his attention, Moses, can't you see? This is you in a nutshell. You get easily angered. You're affected by the people. And he keeps telling Moses, Moses, but I am with you. Stop thinking about the other people. Stop making all of their issues your own. I mean, and he's developing Moses' spiritual character. And in many ways, the wilderness in our life is a way for God to mold and shape yours and my character. So much so that at the end of Moses' life, I love this. Moses' famous last words, one of his last words was to Joshua. And he says, right before he's about to die and enter into the promised land, you know he can't, prom he can't enter because God said you can't. So this is right before he's about to die. He says, the Lord himself goes before you and he will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. 
These are the words from a man who has been shaped so intricately and throughout all the years he has been shaped through God himself in the wilderness. And he's telling his protege, Joshua, do not be afraid. As God has been with me, even through my anger, as God has been with me, he's going to be with you. This is the mark of a spiritually mature person. And in our church, you can tell who the spiritually mature people are by the way they speak to you and the way their, their, you know, their hearts are calm and not all the way left and right, here and there, but they're able to speak God's truth into other people. That's why we have life group facilitators. That's why we have people, uh, you know, praise band leaders and people who are investing into the life of others because God has so much touched their own life. And it's through that spiritual maturity and going through all of the wilderness that they are able to help other people go through the same wildernesses in their lives. And finally, I want to end with empathy and compassion. You know, Jesus himself, as son as he was, it's amazing to me that of all the religions in the world, Many of the religions look at sort of like the Messiah or the Yeshua, this, this great figure that's supposed to come and save the world. They look at this character as like this invincible superhero. Like, oh, this, this character will come and save us. And that's what, the, that's what the Jewish people, the Pharisees, that was their biggest mistake. Jesus was their Messiah. But they were looking for somebody who would come and like, I don't know, fly or something and, you know, make sure all of Rome was decimated and free us from our, you know, uh, free us from all the bondage that we were going under. And they totally missed Jesus. This man who it says, according to Isaiah, was really nothing to look at at all. He wasn't good looking. He wasn't superhero. He wasn't anything special. Yet he came to die for all of man's sins. And so here is Jesus in the wilderness. In Luke chapter 4 and in Matthew, in the book of Matthew, he talks about Jesus going into the wilderness, being led by the Spirit. And in Jesus' own wilderness, he wasn't some superhero that didn't need testing. He himself went through the test. And what do the three tests show? He was tempted by power. Hey, why don't you take these, stones, take these stones and turn them into bread if you're the Messiah? He was tempted by riches. I will give you all the kingdom of the world if you just bow down to me. That's what Satan says to him. And then he was tempted by glory and fame. Hey, jump off from this ledge and the angels will come and save you and you'll be the Messiah. I know you're the Messiah. Why don't you test God? All of these things that many times, quite frankly, if we were given the opportunity of unlimited riches, if we were given the opportunity of ultimate fame and glory, would you and I not take these things? I really wonder. But it is in this wilderness that Jesus goes through himself. And God help, makes him go through all of these things so that in the end, what we would be able to see is not a man who was all about himself and, oh, yeah, I'm going to get the glory. I'm going to get all the riches. I'm going to get all the power and the influence of all of these worlds. No, he comes in the wilderness, it's where God shapes him to become the servant that he is. He didn't come to rule over this world. He came to save it through his sacrifice and his willingness to serve others. And this 
is why Jesus, I, I, again, I'm, gonna, I'm sharing everybody's like, famous last words, Joseph's last words, Moses' last words, and look at Jesus' last words. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, this is the encouragement, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You know, I love these words of Jesus because there's so much compassion, so much empathy that emanates from Jesus. And where does he get this empathy? And it says actually in the Hebrews, look at what it says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. It says, for this reason, he, meaning Jesus, had to be made like them fully human in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people because he himself suffered when he was tempted he is able now to help those who are being tempted do you see what this verse is saying this verse is saying that Jesus didn't come on this earth like some superman with a cape and like he was invincible and like he was flying around and telling people, well, I'm going to save you. I'm going to save you, Lois Lane. I'm going to save you, you know, you uh, dog that's sitting on top of a tree. I mean, he, that's not his MO. That's not what Jesus comes to do. Jesus came as a human being like you and I. He came as a human, flesh and skin, with emotions. He cried. He wept. He did these things. He felt all of the emotions like you and I can so that he can understand you and I. You know, I find that in the world today, people who have the worst um, compassion and empathy are people who's never been through experiences before. And that's why they say things like, oh, well, you know, duh, you're homeless, then, you know, why don't you just get a job? I remember I was actually crossing the 225 here, the bridge that there's a lot of homeless. And I remember there was a guy on a Jeep. I don't know why it's always a Jeep, but it was a guy in a Jeep, right? Who like goes, like he revs his you know, thing at the red light, right? And all that black smoke is coming on my CRV, right? And I'm like, what is this guy doing? He rolls down the window. As soon as it turned green, he goes, rolls down the window to the, 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 the homeless guy asking for money. He goes, why don't you just effing get a job and save everybody else's time? And he just, just like screeching his tires, runs away. I'm just like, gosh, you couldn't just, you know, get out. I mean, uh, anyway, I, I have words for this, but I cannot say it up on this stage. <laughs> but I thought to myself as I was driving through that black smoke, wow, this person has never knew what it felt like to sleep on a bench on a cold night. Never. I don't think he's ever known. And maybe this guy doesn't know what it's like to, how do you know this guy's story? Now, I didn't stop. I wish I did. But I would have loved to hear this person's story, the, the beggar. Maybe he was a vet, and he served our country faithfully, and he gave his own life so that you and I can have freedom. But like many people who go to the war, they come back with PTSD. It's a real thing. And it's painful to go through all of the things that they have seen in war. And so they come back home, and the world is different from where they grew up in. 
and they have mental incapacities. I mean, they have dreams and these nightmares and flashes, and they just can't seem to get life together again. Is the best thing to tell that person, just go get a job? It's not that easy. There's no compassion. You don't know what it feels like. You don't know what he or she has been through. And so to ease, to say a simple word and say, well, you know, just pick up your boots by your bootstraps and, you know, get yourself a job. I mean, that is, that is just so uncompassionate, unempathetic. Yet Jesus comes into this world and doesn't tell the masses, just get a job. Just stop sinning. Why don't you all stop sinning, all of you? He goes to each and every person personally. Have you noticed that? He gets to know them. He knows them intimately. And he ministers to them out of love and compassion and empathy. Because he too has gone through the temptations that you and I have gone through. And it is in this wilderness experience that God brings God, uh, Jesus Christ, even his son, through in order to, to gain more empathy and to gain more compassion for his fellow human. So the wilderness. We started with Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1, by saying comfort to all you people. And then he talks about why the wilderness in, in Isaiah 40, why the wilderness is important. And then this is how Isaiah 40 ends. I love this. And I just wanted to read it to you to give you some hope and encouragement this morning. The last verse says, God gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. This is the promise for those people who cling on and depend on the Lord. Perhaps this morning you are going through a really difficult wilderness experience and you feel alone you feel tired you feel destitute you don't know where your help is going to come from well isaiah 40 this morning shares with each and every one of us that god speaks to us through the wilderness and it is in this time of discomfort and in this time of pain that god will be closest to each and every one of you and not only that but this morning i want to encourage all of us that he loves us and that those who trust in him, those who hope in the Lord, we will renew our strength. And so I pray that this morning we would think about what is God doing in this wilderness? Is he shaping our character? Is he maturing us? Or perhaps maybe he's giving us more compassion and empathy. Whatever he is doing in your life, I pray that we would seek him and that he would be able to speak to you in that desert place. Let's pray, everyone. <clears throat> uh, we're going to have a time of prayer and reflection. Um, we want to just take a moment, maybe just a minute, just to pray and ask God. It says to seek him with all your heart, and he will. He will answer you. So if you're going through a wilderness period at this moment, maybe in your life or in your stage, you want to just cry out to the Lord and renew your hope in Him. I just wanted us to take this short moment this morning to reflect upon these truths and to call out to the Lord. Let's pray.